So good morning, everybody. My name is Drew Lentz. Uh, I am a wireless product manager with Cisco. I've been Cisco for about a year now, and we're having a really good time. And, and part of my job is to look at products and look at the industry and see what's going on. And a lot of that comes with the experience I have working in the industry for a number of years. So I used to work with a whole bunch of different places and all these customers globally. And what I love to do is I love to watch the trends that are happening in the wireless industry and see where they're going. And then I like to pretend that I'm a futurist and that I can see into the future and I can predict what's going to happen. And I've been right with some of them, which is pretty cool. Um, so also, a shameless plug, I have a, a blog at wirelessnerd.net, and then I have a YouTube channel. My wife says, if I get a thousand followers, she'll take me to Mexico. So please subscribe to my YouTube channel. <laughs> I'll send you a postcard. Anyway, what I want to talk about today is something that I'm seeing. And, and this, this, is like a, this is like a Cisco presentation, but not a Cisco presentation. I work here, but this doesn't mean that these are the views of the organization that I work for. This is just me looking at trends and things that are happening in the industry. And it makes me wonder over and over and over again, where are we going and what are we doing? And this presentation actually picks up where Peter McKinsey left off in February at WLPC. It sparked my interest and it made me wonder about site surveys. Are site surveys going to go away? Will they eventually go away? And so to break that down, what I wanted to look at first is the reason that we have site surveys in the first place. I, I picked five topics, and these not all encompassing, but the five topics I'm looking at are one, you want to physically locate devices. You want to make sure they're installed correctly. You want to make sure the antenna is tilted the way it's supposed to. You want to make sure that when you go, you know, why do you have to be on site? That's, I guess, the, the big question. Two, you want to verify that the devices are transmitting the way that they're supposed to. Cables are connected. Connectors are, are not full of water, so on and so forth. Three, you want to identify obstructions. What better way than to see an obstruction than go out and see it yourself? You don't know that there's two poles there on the CAD drawing because they only put one, for example. So things like that. You want to verify those obstructions. Four, you want to check for interferers. That's, a, that's probably one of the most common, right? You want to get out on site because you don't know what that RF environment looks like unless you're there physically. You don't know that the building across the street on Tuesday hosts a big conference of you know, WLAN Pi pros or you know, working on their, their WLAN Pies. You have no idea. And number five, you want to report and validate. This is what I did. Here's what I did. Trust me, the network is going to work the way that it's supposed to. So to me, these are the, the top five reasons. Again, could be right, could be wrong. What about packet capture? Packet capture is super important, especially on site. There's very few ways to do packet capture unless you're there, right? Not right. Peter McKenzie's talk called Analysis of the Future at WLPC in February discusses specifically this. So if you haven't, you haven't figured that one out yet, you haven't uh, looked into it, please check it out. So is a site survey even necessary anymore? 2023, or October, do you really have to go on site and do a site survey? We saw tools all week that showed you why you can, or how you can put yourself into a scenario where you can see an access point, you can see placement, you can see walls. It's not the first time it's done it. IB Wave's been doing this for quite a while, right? You can go out and you can use these tools and then you can take that information and you can do something like drop it into VR, drop it into AR. How many of y'all were here last year and saw what I was doing with VR right outside that door? Yeah, it's pretty awesome. We could take an entire CAD drawing, we could load it in, and Timo just left, and Timo's the one who helped me with the software. You can take this drawing, you can put it in there, you can see the environment that you're in, you can do predictive analytics, you can see how well the video streams in a hotel room just by using the floor plan, you can move the placement of the AP around. Four years ago, I took a, a Meraki camera during the middle of COVID and I stuck it in an office because I had an install to do at a convenience store and I didn't trust that the person who was gonna do the install was gonna supply or put the AP in the place that they needed to do it. So what I did is I, I came up with this contraption using a, a company called Spaces that got acquired by Apple, and now they're working on this crazy headset, where we took a camera and allowed me to inject myself in the physical environment virtually using augmented reality through virtual reality from 4,000 miles away to make sure the installers were, were running the cables where they were supposed to. Site savers are expensive. Where's Avans? Did he leave already? <laughs> I had to put a picture of Chris up there. They're expensive. The tool sets are expensive, the equipment's expensive, but more important, the time is expensive. Getting out there is not easy. There's things that are available to keep you in your seat, in your office, and do, I don't know, 90% of the work maybe, from the comfort of your own chair. But the biggest problem is the old computer adage, garbage in, garbage out. If you have bad data coming in, you're gonna have bad data going out. So it's important that you power AI in all shapes and forms, 
with good data. So how do you get this data? Well, let's, let's go one by one on those five bullet items. Number one, if you're trying to physically locate devices, you can use GPS. There's a lot of new APs that have GPS built into them, especially the outdoor ones. Number two, FTM. Y'all heard of FTM? Anyone heard of FTM in here? Oh, man. Watch for FTM in the next year. Find time measurement. These guys, this is something that Google put in Android phones eight years ago. I wrote a blog on it like six or eight years ago. And what it does is it tracks the beam form, it, or it tracks the actual beam. It's like, it's, it's terrible to say it's like sonar, but it basically, it's like you send out the beam. Let's say I'm talking to Mensei, I shoot over to Mensei, and he responds with an act saying, I received your signal, and this is when I received it, and then I go, okay, well, if you received it then, and I got it here, then that means it must be this much time. And it doesn't require data, it doesn't require any of that. It's just bouncing signals and saying, this is how long the signal took to reach somewhere, and how long it took to return. You can use cameras or drones to find these things. What about verifying service? You can use sensors. Anyone take the WLAN pie? Anybody ever heard of a WLAN pie? Anyone take the course this week? You can use sensors to verify service. Dedicated devices that are acting as clients. You can use the network infrastructure. Really cool products out there that, that allow you to use your network to verify that your network is working the way it's supposed to, either at the client side, like a WLAN pie sitting on a desk, or using the AP to monitor what's happening on the network. You can use user devices, synthetic client devices, synthetic software. There's things that I work with on a day-to-day -day basis that are available right now that are collecting information and feeding it into a system. Wireless experience overview, for example. It's taking all this data about how long it takes things to happen for my connection, for my performance, for my network services. It's grabbing all this data, all this telemetry, and it's feeding it back into a dashboard so that I can understand what's happening on my network. Think about this as a data input, right? And this is showing off how we're taking those data inputs and turning them into data outputs. Client roaming analytics. We talked a lot about roaming this week. Understanding when clients are roaming, why clients are roaming, where they're going, why it's a good roam, why it's a bad roam, what the difference is between those. Now we can grab that data, synthesize that data, look at it, and use it. This is already happening today. We're doing things like guided troubleshooting where we take that data, instead of having to ask it a question, saying, hey, hey network, what am I, you know, what's wrong with my network? What's wrong with the access points? We're just saying, hey, we found this. This is what's going on. Click here to fix it. Here's, here's our recommendation on how to fix it. These are things that are already happening along the lines of AI, but you don't think about them as AI. But exactly what they're doing is exactly what we're trying to do. Take telemetry, take information, provide something with it. What about using APs as sensors? So that your AP can test out another AP. So that your AP can test out, you know, a, a specific radio on an access point can test out your entire network. What if your entire network could test itself every day, round robin, and you didn't have to worry about it? You knew that your network was going to test the connectivity, test your network services. How many of you recognize those APs in the picture? <laughs> what about identifying obstructions? This one, is, this one is pretty cool. Do you guys, the news last week, did anybody see what they did at UCSB? Anyone know what a Keller cone is? So a Keller cone is when you hit an obstacle with an RF signal, it creates this little cone, this little spiral of RF that comes out of the side. This is using Wi-Fi to identify objects through walls, using the Keller cones and where they are. The word believe on one side is real letters, and on this side, this is what the RF sees. This is what Wi-Fi sees. So imagine what you can do when your Wi-Fi access points are doing more than serving data, when they're identifying objects, when they're identifying obstacles and desks and tables and chairs, and helping figure out what the attenuation of a wall is. Well, if I have all that information because I'm collecting it via RF sensors, visual sensors, Bluetooth sensors, now I can feed that all into a model. Now, what about interference? Number four, I can use these sensors. I can use client devices. I can use the network to identify where my interferers are. This is old school way to do it. I mean, this has been, we've been doing this for a long time. All these data inputs. What about this? Adrian's tool, MetaGeek. Uh, Adrian's tool and MetaGeek. Whoa. <laughs> These things give you great visualizations. This, is, this, is a, this was just announced. This is in beta, uh, in beta right now. We're seeing visualizations inside dashboard of a popular wireless product that you can see it. This is data that's there. It's just reformatted differently. What about taking all that data and bringing it in so that you can identify when to change channels and only change channels when you're supposed to change channels? Again, this is taking the data that's out there and using it via AI to do something more creative with it to help you do your job. What about working at the client level with technology partners so that I can get all that telemetry, I can get it in, 
and I can bring it into my, to my AI side and use that as a, as a mechanism. What about reporting and validating? The proof's in the pudding. The best way to validate your network is for the customer not have to worry about it. If they don't have to worry about the network, they're not going to complain about the network because it's just doing what it's supposed to be doing. Proof's in the pudding. This data can all be fed into AI. And when this information comes in, this is what makes AI powerful. And when you change that AI into automation and you start to figure out how to automate everything, what does that do for you as an individual? What does that do for your company? What does that do for your job? It allows you to focus on other things, like the technology that you're supposed to be implementing on a day-to-day -day basis. Bring it all into a single dashboard so you can control everything in one place. And you've got a way that AI has changed the way that you do your job by using the network to bring that telemetry to help you focus on the things that are important to you. Thanks.